Okay, my name is Siva Balu. I work as a managing director in, uh, at Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. Uh, my role involves uh, a huge team which is split into five parts. Uh, I have a huge uh, data warehouse operations. We, we think it is the largest healthcare analytics data warehouse in the world. Um, I have middleware operations. We have a private cloud and um, a mainframe. We have a large footprint on mainframe as well as several vendor products. The reason I'm saying that is my presentation is going to be like 60,000 feet. I'm going to take a use case, a business use case, and show you where and how we used AppDynamics and what significant architecture change we made to help our end customers. You know, in 45 minutes, I can only say so much. It's like a movie trailer. But if you're from IT, if you want to have some detailed discussions, I truly believe in sharing knowledge. So we can just go out and geek out the next two days. If you're from business, if you're interested to know uh, uh, volume projections and how to plan for next year or what challenges we had uh, with our customers, I can talk that also. I'm in a unique role where I go to a lot of states and I meet a lot of folks, um, a lot of exotic places like Hawaii and Puerto Rico, and uh, not so exotic places, Fargo, North Dakota, Lewiston, Idaho, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, so uh, the reason I say that is uh, just bear with me for the next few minutes uh, with the whole presentation, and then we can go into detailed discussions. So I'd like to wind up the presentation and have a two-way conversation, right? Now, excuse my title, actually. This is like the so big title. I'm like, Kalyan, what did you do here? He, should have, he was saying, like, we should have said Blue Cross Blue Shield so more people would have come. Performance. I think this is the most used word in this week, either as a verb or as a, or as a noun. You know, everybody talks about performance. It means different things to different people, right? Uh, depending on where you come from, what business you are from. If you're e-commerce, it's a different type of performance. Healthcare, a different type. If you're banking sector, if you're IT, if you're business, it's a whole different. I always like to start my presentations with a personal story. Um, no, I, I, recently, I actually uh, encountered a peak of human performance. I'm not talking about what you're thinking. I said I worked for Blue Cross Blue Shield, not Pfizer. So uh, in September of this year, I ran a 100-mile ultramarathon race. And this picture is around like mile 65, still alive. I have already run like 18, 19 hours and still going. I, I think of this as an application, right? We are all talking about application performance management. If the race is like a release, you know, I was training for this 100-mile. There's a target date. It's an eight-month training plan. Um, in between, uh, do, while I'm running, uh, I have like, sometimes I run fast, performing well like an application, sometimes I'm running slow. Um, sometimes I stop to eat like a couple minutes. That's like my planned system maintenance. I had a 30 hour cutoff limit. I had to run a certain pace to reach the finish line, right? That's like my target SLA. Whether I beat my SLA or meet my SLA is up to me. And they say, like, for runners, most of it is in the head, right? That's like the code logic and the query. Sometimes I go to dark places. Oh, my God, why did I sign up for this? <laughs> That's like having a code issue. <laughs> and at the end of it, uh, and then I had to take bathroom breaks. That's like unplanned maintenance. So <laughs> <laughs> and I finished, and they gave me a huge belt buckle. In the ultra marathons, they give you a belt buckle because it comes from the horse races and the medal. That's like customer satisfaction. At the end of it, you're happy. If I didn't finish, whole different story. Now, since most of you know what is Blue Cross Blue Shield, I just want to take a couple seconds and just give a background to put some context here. Again, Blue Cross Blue Shield means different things to different people. Uh, I was sitting next to this nice lady, elderly person from DC to Chicago in the flight. All two hours she was complaining about her Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, I, I felt empathy because you know all of us are having some kind of healthcare insurance. If you don't have Blue Cross, you have others, it's fine. And at the end of it, I wrote the customer service number. Ma'am, you might want to call this number because she thought I'm working in customer service. And um, later I realized I made a mistake. I gave her my Comcast help desk number. But the point is, people are emotionally attached to their health insurance, right? It's, it's a lot different. I see day in and day out claims and problems with the claims and whatnot. So Blue Cross Blue Shield, it's a federation of uh, 36 licensees. So um, uh, we use the term plan. 
Uh, think of plan as a state. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Florida, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama. New York has three Blue Cross Blue Shields. Uh, there are so many variations. But uh, Anthem is a big plan. It is in 13 or 15 states, Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, I come from Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. Uh, think of it as the headquarters of Blue Cross Blue Shield. We do centralized processing, centralized warehouse, a lot of centralized. Instead of having 50 data centers in 50 states with 50 systems, we are moving towards shared solutions. Uh, people are realizing the benefit of working together and having things in a centralized way. Um, we uh, have a membership of 105 million plus members. The way we say that is one in every three Americans is insured, insured with Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, we are around, actually it's 85 years, uh, present in all 50 states, no brainer there. And this is an important thing. So as I go through this presentation, if you're not from health insurance background, I'll try to give some simple examples so that I can put some context. Right? I wish I was uh, giving a presentation about Game of Thrones. Everybody knows that. Uh, uh, but I'm hoping that I'll make some sense at the end of this. This, is just, this just came out on Monday after I came here. Um, our CIO sent out the monthly newsletter on Tuesday, December 1st. And it's a nice screenshot, like how the fi Fortune 500 companies are using Blue Cross Blue Shield. The top nine of the 10 Fortune 500 companies use Blue Cross Blue Shield. I'm very happy to say AppDynamics uses Blue Cross Blue Shield. So um, again, a lot of members. Recently what happened is we had a strategy, what we call as national programs, or big account, or large employers. For example, I feel I don't see the people here, so I'll talk to you guys for a minute. Uh, for example, our, we are focusing on huge employers like Microsoft, Walmart, n you name it, right? And with the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, what has happened is the focus has moved towards the consumer. I can say to my employer, uh, I don't want your insurance coverage. I don't want those benefits. I'll go to the marketplace. I have four providers, five providers competing with, or payers uh, competing with each other. I will buy whoever I want, so I can say that now with the Affordable Care Act. So what is happening is we are sh shifting the focus from large employers who used to be our large customer base to consumers. We all get so mad if our iPhone crashes, right? But health insurance is something that they say, like, it's the only product where you buy a product without knowing how much it's going to cost you, right? You go to a doctor until you get your explanation of benefits or your bill from the doctor's office, it's always, uh, so our focus is now to give the members who are like you and me and everybody else, empower them to make their decisions before they go to the doctor's office, a simple goal. The thing is, this is a huge system that has been there over 80 years. It's, it's a huge shift in strategy. And then we realized, oh my god, we have been building this data for like 80 years without realizing we already have big data. You know, everybody wants to be in the big data space, in the cloud space, and we have all that, but we just didn't call it big data. And we came out, the board actually came out with the strategy called data as a strategic asset, or it's called internally as DASA. It's our term for big data. We said, okay, let's look at all our databases. Let's start to consolidate them. Let's look at warehouses. Where can we gain the most bang for the buck? How can we make this accessible to the consumers? Now, I see people are tweeting this, it's fine. But if you ever tweeted my photo from the previous slide, you have to pay me co copyrights and royalty, OK? <laughs> Kalyan, I'm talking to you. <laughs> um, so the board, board is like the CEOs of all the states. They have, man, they have uh, given us, they give the direction, they give the money, uh, they're the top boss. So they said, OK, let's go and find how can we use the, I'm not going to read this word for word, but I'm just giving you the story behind this. And we had many systems, many data warehouses. What makes sense to the customer? We need to find that. And we have to consolidate that. We have to make it accessible to the consumers. Focus on consumer, surprise. <laughs> Finally, we realized, oh my god, we need to focus on consumers here. <laughs> then, OK, now this big data, all that is sitting behind the scenes. I'm, I can, like I said, we can go and geek out on that for the next two days. But for this presentation, my focus is going to be our web services. Uh, I'll tell you in a minute how the user is accessing the big data through web services. Now, I talk to a lot of business folks in my role. So 
I had to copy paste from Google or Wikipedia or wherever the definition of web services because the people I usually talk to don't know what is. If you're ever thinking of going the web services route or making more API based calls to your systems, or if you're even starting that, if you're running into struggles, please talk to me after this because over the last three years, I lived and breathed this web services in and out. Um, so the goal is to give real time, secure, responsive, and reliable data. Real time. The way it used to happen is you go to a doctor, you get a bill in one week, and then uh, you pay within the 30 days. It's like a batch process, right? The files goes and comes, and extracts are involved. You go to a portal, you go to Blue Cross Blue Shield of uh, wherever you are, right? Illinois, for example, where I'm from. And you want to find something. I'm going to tell you a couple of examples that you can correlate. I don't want to wait for three days to get my results. I want it right away. And then secure, right? Everybody is paranoid about security. Uh, we have all kinds of uh, malfunctions going on uh, in terms of people trying to steal our data. Now, you know, this is like valuable uh, information that we have. And then this is another definition of the uh, web services. So basically, it's the same thing. Um, if you're new to web services, these two slides should give you a context of what I'm talking about. Uh, and we use APIs like the industry standard. Now, here's the meat of this, what, what the consumer is going to get. Um, consumer cost. So I started by saying that you need to know, say you're going to have a procedure. I hope nobody has it. But say you want to have a knee surgery. You go to your portal, whatever your local Blue Cross Blue Shield site is, and you type in your group number or whatnot, and then you select uh, the area, and then you select knee surgery. You know, there's, I didn't know, there are like 99,000 types of knee surgeries out there. So you, you will get an idea in like, within a second, what is it going to approximately cost you? Is it a bread or is it a bakery? You know, is it $100 or is it $100,000? Patient review, this is interesting. This is like help for doctors. So now with the Affordable Care Act, which is again Obamacare, um, they're collecting feedback about doctors. Uh, basically, if I'm a patient, I went to a hospital or a provider or whatnot, and I can go and write feedback about that patient. The idea is, I think in two or three years, the reimbursement to the doctors is going to be based upon their ratings. Imagine that. So far, it was not happening, right? So this is a new need. And this is like really like help for doctors, but in a more secure, more consolidated, it is audited, it's like, it's, it's complex, but at a, in a simple way, if I'm a consumer, I'm going to go to a doctor for something. I can read about the doctor in a secure site, not in some public website, and understand before I go there. Provider data. So we have a huge repository called provider data repository. And uh, that correlates with what we call as provided faceted search. So provider is a doctor, to keep it simple, or a hospital. So I can search variations of, OK, I have an um, eye problem and a knee problem and a hip problem. So I can put those faceted information. I can find a hospital or a doctor's office that provides me that, in, that kind of service, and I can go there. Member out of pocket, the most important, right? I want to know how much I'm going to pay when I visit a doctor. Eligibility. So this is a, where you all have your insurance card. You go there, and they call somebody, and they say, like, is this a valid card? How, how will they know that you have eligibility, right? You have a coverage. Uh, this is a real-time system where they can find your eligibility. The biggest advantage of Blue Cross Blue Shield is no matter which state you're from, which is we call as a home state, you can go to any other state, which we call as a host state, and you can get the same kind of uh, coverage, same out of pocket, if you go to a Blue Cross Blue Shield provider. We have systems built to talk to st each state. And let me ask this quick question, because I don't want my audience to like, pass out on me. So when you think of health insurance and you think of IT, what are some of the challenges that comes to your mind right away? Go. Data. Sorry? Data privacy. Data privacy, very good. Security. Enrollment process, very complex. What else? Yes. You, sir? Records of information, sharing in a secure way. Think about all the federal laws, state laws, county laws. You know, we have to write business logic to satisfy every other law that is there. So eligibility is not an easy thing like we think it is. Claim status. This is like, I. Mostly this comes from doctor's offices, right? Doctor submit claims, whatnot. Subscriber information, and more and more. So this is a sampling of what we provide using our real-time web services, right? There is more 
but just to give you a flavor of what kind of information you can get. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about our web service architecture. So these are different layers. At the top, you see the end user, the ultimate powerful person, the consumer, right? I think there is some kind of a pointer here. Oops. OK. Anyway, I'll just talk to it. <laughs> the load balancer is like the external load balancer when the traffic comes. What you see at the top as a network layer is um, we have a private network called BluesNet. All the Blue Cross Blue Shield plans are connected using our private network, actually fully secure, fully encrypted private network. Until two years ago, the executives wanted to get rid of it. They're like, why do we need to maintain our own network, right? Internet is getting so fast. We have VPN. It's cheap. Now, after we had like three or four major, major breaches, like if you are following the news, you know what I'm talking about. Everybody's like, how can we empower our private network? We don't want to let it go. We want this. So, and now we are expanding to the consumer. So we also have secure internet. The second layer is load balancer. I'll skip that. And then you see on the left side, um, API management. That's where when somebody comes to us, we have to authenticate this is the right user. API key gets passed and it comes back. We have a secure gateway and then an internal load balancer. This is where things start to get dicey because now it has to go to all these places and load balance and process the load. Web server layer, app server layer, database layer. I try to simplify this as much as possible for this presentation. So if a user is sending a request, they're getting a response, simple. And these are the products we are using, F5. We're using a product called Intel Express Gateway for the gateway. We're using API Mashery, which is, it used to be an Intel product. Now it's owned by TIPCO. Um, and then we have IHS for web server. Web, we are a Java web sphere shop. And we use Oracle for this particular example as a, a data warehouse. So a simple depiction. So I'm a consumer, and I live in Chicago. I want to go and find something, right? I put it pink so that it will be like a female. So um, They want to find something. What they want to find? Anybody know what they want to find? Any guesses? That was the test. The previous things I said, member out of pocket, claim status, eligibility. They want to find something, right? Feel free to heckle or whatever is fine. Um, so they try to search it. From their computer, it goes to the internet. And then it goes to the local Blue Cross Blue Shield plan. So if you're in California, it goes to one of the two plans, uh, either uh, Blue Shield of California or Anthem Blue Cross of California. If you're in Florida, it goes to Blue Cross Blue Shield, whatever your local plan is. From there, it goes to either the private network or inter um, internet. Why we are using private network or internet? What is happening is, in the healthcare space, there are a lot of vendors that are coming in, like Mekison or Availity, who are providing uh, services to the Blue Cross Blue Shield plan. So we want them to come. We don't want them in our private network, so we want them to come through internet. Then we have the technology stack. Think of the previous slide, right? I showed you the stack that's going here, and then the giant core warehouse. So this is how a typical call comes. Uh, a simplified format of what happens. Now, if I dissect each one of those segments, there is more complexities. And it translates to performance, right? I want to send this person whatever she's asking in sub-second. When I say sub-second, it could be milliseconds, microseconds, but less than one second. That's how the human can respond. Like, if it's five seconds, she will know that this, this website is slow. It has to be sub-second. Now, let's, let's take an easy example. Um, I want to find how many doctors are providing family medicine in zip code 60601, which is downtown Chicago. Okay? So she's going to find it. We want to give her um, all the doctors. And then she selects a criteria that says within five mile radius or 10 mile radius. Right? You all, we all do that. We, all, we want to find, let me tell you an equivalent example that might make sense, Fandango. Right? You want to find what's a movie theater nearby. <laughs> Same concept. Um, now. We talked about the technology stack, how the user gets to it. Let's talk about what happened in the last five years. So when we started web services in 2009, it was kind of a pilot 0.0 version. In 2010, the first production, we had 50,000 calls a year. Pay attention to the leftmost and the rightmost. In between what happened, we had like 900,000 transactions in 2011, and we were like opening champagne bottles. We were like, we're going to reach million calls a year. Oh my god, we need to have party and bonuses and whatever. And then we reached 7.5 million. 
2012. What we did is we immediately increased the CPU and memory and all kinds of infrastructure. We said, we need more capacity, right? Because now we went like 8x almost, 7.5, 8x. So we started throwing in like, like increase the network card from like 100 meg to one gigabytes. Increase the capacity from an infrastructure standpoint, right? We did all that. 2013, I would never forget 2013 because on the first business day of the year, which is the most important day for us because everybody is trying to find their um, eligibility. If you're in a doctor's office, your doctor is like, oh my God, does this patient have coverage after the new year? We had a huge crash, but that is not part of the story here. <laughs> we reached 18 million, almost tw twice. So we were able to somewhat manage. We had a lot of CPU, a lot of memory. Then we went to 80 million. Then, uh, what do you say, the stuff hit the fan. Uh, I think this is not adulterated present. Anyway, <laughs> so from 18 million to 80 million. Now, the last one you're seeing is only until October because Libby and Kalyan are asking me, give me the presentation. So this is the first 10 months, uh, which means on an average, we get a million calls a day. Now, these are not like I'm sitting in an app and checking or browsing Google. This is not commercial, right? This is not e-commerce. People are checking their claim status, their eligibility, member out of pocket. It's like complex stuff from a healthcare perspective. So there is a lot of business logic involved behind it. Like we talked earlier, it has to be secure, the laws, the rules. And in between what is happening is, in 2013, 2014, we are working to enhance the system to accommodate affordable care act, right? It is kicking on 1-1-2015. So we are doing all kinds of stuff, and also we want to make sure there is no production issue, right? Now, the reason I'm showing this is, this is real data, and you can see like how we were like deer in the headlight. Oh my God, <laughs> we increased all this. Now what's the problem? And somebody said, I think we need to look into the application performance. Oh, geez, <laughs> the bulb went off. <laughs> so what's the problem? <laughs> it's classic, 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 right? Capacity, okay, we put hardware, software, network. Performance started like, uh, response time. So I said subsecond because we did a lot of research Believe me, we have a lot of research people doing research, right? And then they said, if the response is less than one second, the user will not see slowness. So we started calling this project a sub-second response project. Nobody cared if it is one millisecond or 10 millisecond. Anyway, so the point is, we wanted 100% SLS. Think about this. You go to Blue Cross Blue Shield site and you're trying to find a doctor within your zip code for five miles. Every time it gives a timeout, you'll be thinking, right? Maybe I should go to somebody else, United or whatever. So, United Health, I meant. We wanted, no matter what the SLA says, right? The SLA might say, uh, we really have an SLA, which says 99% of all the web service calls within a 24 hour period should be within one second. 98% should be within two seconds. And this SLA is, what I said just now, is a summary. It's like a 25 page document that talks about all this. But think about the consumer. We don't want anybody to have a timeout. So we wanted, from an IT perspective, from our business perspective, from a, we are like a service provider, right, at this time, 100% SLA, how can we reach there? And then increase research time. That's where we really sucked, because, you know, it's always a classic, it's not the core issue. Okay, we did CPU, hardware, memory, blah, blah, blah. We increased the cluster. And then we started looking at, if we think there's a core problem, or maybe there's a query problem, because I want to go back to that. I told you to pay attention to the leftmost, right? The reason I told that is, when we were having 50,000 transactions, whoever was designing the web services, it's like an application, right? You code in Java, you put it in a JVM. We went to 7.5 million, we created a cluster, okay? But it's the same code, and this guy kept, or this guy, or team, or whatever, the development start putting in logic, like member out of pocket, uh, eligibility, into the same big Java program or module. So the, we had like one giant EAR file to deploy, which had all the logic, which means our web service calls were competing with each other for the logic, right? It's the same code, and it was running over and over for 250 million times, like, like a million calls a day. So going back, the code we had was really what we built in 2009, 2010. We never enhanced the code or looked into that. We were just like, this will work. We had to do other things. So, and then the final thing is no-brainer, right? Our consumer satisfaction was really, really bad at that time. Now, I had to say this for real because we are in App Dynamics uh, presentation. Where does App Dynamics come in all this? So, if you see the way I'm going is, I give you the background, the technology stack and architecture, the business use case, and 
now we are, we are fairly new to AppDynamics, okay? We are using it for less than one year in production. Um, so these two go hand in hand, right? We, ha we have all kinds of tools. Over the years, we always bring in, whoever speaks louder gets the most, right? Uh, being in BMC Patrol, Dynatrace, Hyperic, you name it, we have all of it. Now somebody said, you know, in the Gartner four quadrants, are you guys, who's familiar with the Gartner quadrants? Exactly. <laughs> I hate all of you, no. <laughs> Some architects said, I think AppDynamics is right there in the right fourth, uh, like the top cor uh, corner. Okay, we need to buy that product now. And this is no disrespect to AppDynamics. You have to see where I come from, right? We have these 100 products, and we are bringing one more product. So we brought in AppDynamics, we did a demo, and then we started a proof of concept. So we needed a tool to probe and get to the problem quickly. That's where AppDynamics comes in. We are fairly new to using this. Now, we have seen some results. We are going to see in the next few slides what we did architecturally. But we are kind of getting a good handle, and we are really, really excited to use AppDynamics in our web services environment, which we consider the most complex because that was directly facing the end consumer, like you and me. Now we are moving it to tier one business applications. By tier one, what I mean is it really impacts our revenue. Think of it this way. If we charge $1 for a web service call, right? Just for the sake of this discussion, I cannot disclose two things. One is the dollar values, and one is the uh, personal health information. Anything else I'll share, system logs, numbers, performance. <laughs> so if anybody wants to know how we did the performance testing, how we enhanced I'm willing to share that with you guys, the technology numbers. So if we have an outage, say for one day, in our web services platform, we lose $1 million, easily gone. It's directly impacting our bottom line there, right? Calculate that for one hour, two hour. It's just direct impact on our SLA, on our uh, revenue. Right now, what we have done is, okay, we had this in web services, and then we are moving it to business applications. We are working on a strategy, and I would highly recommend, if you are new to AppDynamics or using it for a while, please look into their product suite and come up with a strategy. What do we want to do in 2016, 2017, and try to execute it? And we are really good at that. We come up with 10-year strategy and we execute it. That's how the system where I come from works. So we are working on a strategy, how to bring APM into our software development lifecycle. Usually, performance is an afterthought for us, or we extrapolate performance. We have a performance environment, which is not a lookalike of production, and then we say, okay, if this runs and so fast, and then it'll run so fast in production. So extrapolating the numbers, now we are realizing, okay, APM cannot be an afterthought. And we learned a lot in the last, uh, less than one year, but last 10 months, I would say. So those are the two layers that where we use AppDynamics. Now, what I would like to leave when we finish this is, what did we learn and what mistakes we made, and like nobody in AppDynamics is going to say, I'm not going to help you. They will definitely try to help you, whatever you want. But we have our own culture, our politics, our people, uh, other tools, and we want to make sure that you guys want to make sure that it's not only important to buy a product and bring it in-house. It's very important to have a strategy and to make sure there's adoption, right? So we put AppDynamics in these two layers. We did a POC, and this is a true story. We did a POC January to March, and we were so excited we started using POC servers for production. Okay, we didn't buy the production license. <laughs> and then May, the auditor comes like, wait a minute, are you using a POC server for production? <laughs> we, are, we are like an audited company all the time. So we rapidly like, uh, deployed production servers and whatnot. So we were really seeing the results in terms of uh, finding that uh, issue quickly. I'll show you an example right away, what we learned. So a couple of examples. First one is zip code search. Earlier I said an example, right? Are you guys still with me? Who is still with me? 60601. Exactly. You get a drink on me tonight. So <laughs> he remembered the zip code. So here's, here's why Montana comes into picture. I'm trying to connect the dots here, people. Stay with me. <laughs> Somebody went in Montana and tried to look for this specific provider for a specific procedure, and she, she searched within five miles, right? Nobody was there. I think her neighbor was there in the five miles, but... <laughs> 10 miles, 15 miles. It goes 5, 10, 25, 50. You all can go and see in your own websites, right? And then she put the ultimate deal breaker, 500 miles. No results. Our system crashed like a baby. Like <laughs> because what she's trying to do is, do you remember the whole core warehouse I was showing there? It's going and searching the whole index back and forth. Oh my god, there is no provider there. And that's one example. 
Okay? The other example is the other extreme, the Chicago downtown zip code, right? Somebody searched five miles, and there are 2,000 providers for that particular type of. So we have to now give them 2,000 doctors' names and contact details. So how many of you have gone and searched anything and looked at 2,000 results? Nobody, right? <laughs> you go to Google, you get like 25 in the first screen, you're done, like whatever comes to the top. So we were struggling with this kind of like anomalies, right? It totally skewed our performance. Until this return the result, what is happening? Hundreds of other people are getting timeouts because it's taking all the resources. It's chugging in the query and the application. The other one is the query. So this, this example I said goes hand in hand. There is application code. Now we have 2,000 results. What do we return to the consumer, right, in their portal? On the flip side, what is the query that's running? What is the index? Why it is going and searching all kinds of tables? Because remember, I said we wrote the code in 2009, 2010. <laughs> it's still having the same old code, and it's still trying to, like, no, no context of growth in data or growth in search criteria. It's just searching it. So very, very significant from where we sit and we were looking at it. Oh my god, these are like revealing to us, like from app dynamics. Like we didn't spend a team of 10 for a three month period. We got it in our POC actually. That's why we started using POC for production. <laughs> so then what we did? These two go hand in hand. I'm not saying the code that was before was not intelligent, okay? That will be a disrespect to my peers. All I'm saying is we added intelligence because it's kind of outdated at that point in time. And second thing is very, very important. So what happened is when we got the 2,000 results, we actually only, we didn't even care about 2,000. You only cared about 25 because you as a human person can only see 25 at a time. When you're looking at your 25 doctors, we are working on the next 25. So when you click next, we return the next 25. Then you are just looking at the 25, okay, I don't like this, I don't like this, blah, blah, blah. We are working on the next 25. Zoom, zoom, zoom. If you stop your search, if you close the window, go somewhere, we are not returning any more results. So we added some intelligence in the way we returned the code. And then we did it, perform we created a performance engineering environment, a lookalike of production. We used App Dynamics. Today we use App Dynamics in two environments, performance and production, and we try to mimic it. It gave us huge wins quickly. Are you guys still with me? Okay. Significant query tuning, that's, that's like this. Then we started expanding our environment. This is where it starts getting fun. So what we did is, okay, it doesn't make sense to have this huge, giant web service program to do all the things I said, consumer cost, eligibility, claim status, remember? So we started modularizing into small, small web service modules. And then we started breaking down our core warehouse. I'll tell you how in a minute. So all of you familiar with this one? Are you all still with me? Okay. This is like the two hundred, like a million people, right? Every day they're hitting the same warehouse, same thing. We went to this model. This is uh, the way I would say the layman's way of showing you what we did. <laughs> so what we did is very, very, very niche in the sense that if you want to know the zip code or the providers in a zip code, right? Provider search, you go to Data Mart A. So we had an ETL that moved the data to a data mod. It had only the data that is needed for the zip code search, and it had the code in the technology stack only to do the zip code search, and then it had the consumer. Our goal was to give sub-second response to the consumers. So we were like, boom, boom, boom. We went from an average of three to four seconds, the worst case scenario, five minutes. Who waits five minutes for a web page to come? To sub-second, right away. And then, you know, sometimes in IT we go from zero to 100. We didn't just start creating data mart after data mart. If you look at data mart C, the green color, two web services can use the same data mart depending on. So earlier I showed something called provider data, provider faceted search. Both are provider data. So we don't need two data mart. We can have one data mart, but two logic, two code can go and access the one data mart. So we, this is our new model. This is what we're doing today. And this happened in the last six months after we implemented. So we totally um, um, redesigned our architecture. We invested in it. Because when we did the ROI, the cost to do this is extremely, extremely less compared to loss in revenue, production issues, and the most important is customer satisfaction. Remember, going back to my introduction, we are competing in the marketplace with other healthcare provider payers. We cannot afford to have poor consumer experience. 
This is what I call as obligatory app dynamic screenshot slide. <laughs> now, I was going to show a lot of things like spreadsheets and numbers, but I want to drive a point of what we learned, what mistakes we made, how we changed our architecture. But I would like to focus your attention on the green circles. That's a cluster that's accessing its own database. This pointer is not working or something, or I don't know how to use this. But you can see we split into different. So are you guys seeing this, the four? The four, four. So each one is a web service app. And then it calls its own data model. You can see different databases. So that's kind of what we did. And this is from our production environment. Now, this is just a simple snapshot. I can expand this and show you many, many, many web services, many, many data models. Now, we are, we are seeing some uh, success in um, web services. And this is another uh, business application, tier one business application. So we moved from old school mainframe, uh, MS, CSES screens to Java. And the usage grew 6,000 percentage in five, six years. It's a claim volume. High complex data getting processed for the users, like customer support, they want to check claims, whatever. So this is one of our complex tier one application. What we did is we put app dynamics just for the kicks and giggles, and we said, where is the roadblock? Where are we getting time modes? What's happening? We did an analysis. And then what we did is, we, if you look at the green circle, we just went from single JVM to a highly clustered node, eight nodes. My point is, we were quickly able to, uh, we were quickly able to see, OK, this, there's a bottleneck in our capacity. And our code is fine. Our database is fine. We need to cluster the environment. Now, this may not be directly uh, related to APM, but we learned something out of putting app dynamics and probing the data and seeing, oh my god, this is just what we need to do. And this is kind of our progression, what we did with app dynamics. We did a proof of concept. Even though it shows January to March, we were using the proof of concept server till August until the auditor came to me and they said, like, hey, man, watch out. And then we have two environments, performance engineering and production. We implemented the new web services, the split of data mart. Uh, the controller upgrade, that's when we moved from our POC, which is a Windows, which is only used for POC, to a Linux, because we are moving towards a Linux platform so that in future, if we become a hybrid cloud or whatnot, we can use Linux easily to port the um, infrastructure. And then we are doing applications. Now we are working on a strategy for takeaways. Define the scope of what you want to do with App Dynamics, right? We did that very well. We wanted, we know what we want to do. We wanted to use App Dynamics in web services. But you see, I have italics on the right side. How to use the products? We didn't do a good job on that. We just installed App Dynamics, and somebody told my CIO, App Dynamics will solve all your problems. These guys here are happy to hear that, but let me tell you a true story. Do a proof of concept. Low cost, no risk. Decide if it's on-premise. I'm coming from healthcare, no-brainer. We want to have an on-premise. We do have an on-premise. But I'm a proponent of cloud solutions in general as philosophy. Strategy, the most important. It's not important to buy a product. It's not important to like, assign a resource. It is very important to decide what you want to do in the next two to five to six years in your APM space. Very, very important. In your particular business, it might mean different things, right? People. Oh my god, I had a hard time educating my staff and my customers and my peers because App Dynamics, while it's the greatest product ever, it will not solve all of your problems if your people don't understand what it can give them. Right? Now I have internal customers like Federal Employee Program. They come and ask me, hey, we asked about this, we heard about this app dynamics. Can we use it? The first question is, do you know what it is? <laughs> Process. So now in production, we found all the issues. We said the code sucks, the data mart is too huge. You need a process to take that and feed it into your development cycle, whether it is SDLC or Agile or whatever. And you want to be very diligent in creating that feedback loop, right? If you're going to not create the feedback loop, what's going to happen? You're going to get stuck with operations guys dealing with production issues forever. You need that feedback loop. However your model is, your, your local, your, uh, your company is uh, designed in org structure. Provisioning mechanism, that is something for me. I have internal customers. I have um, claims uh, business unit is one customer. Federal employee is another customer. Strategic services is another customer. When they come and ask me, hey, can we use App Dynamics? 
I want to take that 1,000 licenses and slice and dice and provision to them. Okay? I want to do analysis. Are you a good candidate for app dynamics? Are you using any C++ or funky products, or are you using Java and database? So you need to have a provisioning mechanism. How to use app dynamics? That ties back to your strategy. Right? You need to know that. Last but not the least, this is something I'm doing personally. In every session, I'm taking some notes like crazily, like I need to take it back. They have extensions for a lot of things. Like we are looking into MQ and several other things, analytics and whatnot. So I think it's a decent suite of products. I'm very excited with the new products, with server monitoring, end user monitoring. So we are going to explore all that, and it's part of our strategy. That brings me to the end of my dog and pony show. So, so I'll open up for any questions. If you guys are still awake, is everybody still with me? Sorry, the light is blinding on me. Go ahead. So the question is, you had the code from 2010. You said you changed in the last six to eight months, in the, in the last one year. How did you do it quickly? The answer is smart people. The most imp really, it's Java code, Oracle database, no brainer. The most important thing is you need the buy-in from the top. Your CIO, your VP, your CTO needs to say, I need to see results. Think about what is happening. 1-1-2015, the most important date for healthcare. Oh, Affordable Care Act was kicking in. So we were running against time, and we saw all this performance, right? Likewise, now we deployed all the code. Now we are seeing, okay, in 2015, we brought AppDynamics. We had that rigor in the organization. So we actually put a dedicated team of performance engineers, coders, testers, operations guys, and we worked in an agile mechanism, if you're familiar with agile scrum, to quickly get it out. And we just implemented, um, I would say the third data mart in September, and the fourth is going end of this year. So we are kind of going very fast on that. We are not there yet. We are just starting the journey. Did I answer your question? Very good. Yes, go. Sorry? Mobile strategy. Three years ago, yes, we, did, we had a mobile strategy. It was all mobile. Right now, our strategy is um, data, big data, and cloud. The reason is, uh, just think of it this way. Uh, we realized pretty soon, yes, mobile is important. Everything is done in mobile, but it has limitation for us. All they're going to do is look at all, whatever they're doing in the website, they can do in a mobile. So that is there, but there is no enhancement for us. It's just a static input for the users. And most of our users are, I want to say this, but kind of old school. You know, they like going to website, calling the doctor's office. So right now, mobile is not top of our list, but I'm assuming it will be there sometime in the next couple of years. Any other questions? Go ahead. Very, very interesting question. Are you collecting any data like PHI, PII, which is a HIPAA loss, which is bound by the HIPAA loss? That's why we did the POC. And yes, it is probing our PHI data. And the, that's why we decided to go on-premise. So everything is done by, so one thing to note about privacy is it is okay to have access to privacy. It is okay to give access, but it has to be tightly controlled. You need to have those controls, those paperwork and auditable things. Uh, in our case, that is not a big problem. The only thing the, the PHI PII came into picture is to decide whether to have on-prem or cloud, and we did an on-prem. No, uh, all our servers are encrypted at rest. But, so AppDynamics is installed in a server that's encrypted at rest. Go ahead. Correct. OK, very good question. So the question is, you have all these data masks that I showed, A, B, C, D, colorful. And then how do you maintain the data integrity? Except for claim status, which is one of the things we do. Everything else is kind of static data. So we have Informatica ETL jobs running every night. But if you think about it, you're not going to have significant change overnight for your doctors in a zip code or your eligibility. You know? So when those happen, those are significant business impact. We do it over a weekend. Like the new year, we'll have all the eligibility jobs run and sync up the data mart. So that's how we do by uh, business case, use case spaces, use case spaces. Right? Yes, yes. All databases and all application code. Yes. Which um, team in your structure manages the integration and implementation of that? 
It's done by the application operations team. Do you have a DevOps? We don't have a DevOps model. There's a hard line between developers and operations because of PHI reasons. It's good and bad. Like. Any other questions? Yes, please. The hard line is in terms of access. The developers cannot access any production or production data system. But the model we use is Agile Scrum. In Agile Scrum, what happens is you have a daily story. All the people come into a room. You have a developer. You have a tester. You have a performance engineer. So they work as a team. The hard line is only for access. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, please. Perf yes, we do use our, actually for this particular one, usually we don't use, but for our web services, we uh, copy the production data to test only the performance engineering. If you looked at my slide where I had, we have app dynamics only in one, two environments. Both environments have the production data. And both have the same control, same everything. Is it the identified data or is it the No, it is not. All other environments, we have like seven web service environments. All five others are uh, ID identified and just mockup data. We call it performance engineering, but it's kind of a pre-prod, uh, just because the, that's the way we used to call. And it has the same uh, server hardening, same access control, same everything, like production. That is absolutely right. See, if you think about this, what happens is a bad data access path, or a lot of things in production, we were not able to recreate and test, because we didn't have the exact same combination of data. So we had to do that uh, data copy from production to test or performance engineering. Yes, please. Not yet. Um, I'm sure we'll engage them more. Uh, what happened is we have this huge IT team internally, but we always go to them with questions. They've been extremely helpful in all kinds of uh, stupid questions through complex questions, uh, but they have not really influenced how we change our design. Our architects influence that. Yes, please. Yes. Yes, but uh, if you're asking about what type of service, uh, I have to talk to my sales rep here. <laughs> so you guys take it offline. <laughs> yes, please. Very good question. Are you going to put App Dynamics in the gateway layer? So the reason we have App Dynamics only in the Java layer, or web, because IHS is a web server, and we cannot put App Dynamics there. Our gateway is coded in C or C++. Uh, Intel ESG is a product. We couldn't do that. And that's why now we are talking to them about extensions that they're working on. And we are also offering to be like a beta shop so that we can test it for them. And then the end user monitoring is something I'm psyched about to use, because that's going to go through and come back. We use a different product for end user monitoring called AlertSight. But what it doesn't give us is where the problem is. I think AppDynamics is going to tell us where the problem is when we use the end user monitoring, at least from what I have seen so far. OK, it's a wrap up. Um, I can take one more question. I'm going to be here. If you want to ever uh, get in touch with me, uh, my name is Siva Balu, S-I-V-A dot B-A-L-U at B-C-B-S-A dot com. You can feel free to reach out to me. Make sure you tell me who you are because I get a lot of vendor emails which goes directly to trash, not these guys. <laughs> but just say, hey, I met in AppSphere, whatever. So I'm, I'm very, I'm, I believe in truly sharing information, sharing knowledge, not the HIPAA information, but <laughs> whatever we learn in terms of performance and system data. Okay, thank you all for showing up.